thank you all for attending this morning. Uh, I'm really excited to speak to you. Um, like Toby said, I am a PhD student. I'm in my first year in the human kinetics program. I specialize in health, safety, and wellness. Um, and I've been a student member and an affiliate member of CROSH now for going on six years. And I can really say that the opportunities like the internship I'm gonna share about today um, have really been pretty foundational for helping to situate myself within the OHS field. And they really do drive a lot of my research interests. So I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all this morning and um, perhaps intrigue a few of you to want to partner in the future. So my presentation is going to kind of follow three main parts, a little bit of an overview of my internship and who I got to partner with. Uh, a little bit about big data analysis to share the work that I did with the company and then some of the learning outcomes that I gained from the experience as well. So I was very lucky to be able to be placed with Torex Gold Resources Inc. under the direct supervision of Nelson Bodnarchuk. He is the Director of Health, Safety and Training for Torex. Uh, and my internship ran through the fall semester. So September to December with a little bit of overlap into this January. And I completed about 150 hours of work uh, for them. So a little bit of background on them as a company. Um, they are a gold mining company. They're based in Canada, but they engage in their exploration, their development and production in Mexico. Um, so their current operations, they've got three open pit mines, an underground mine, along with all of the um, supporting infrastructure and processing plants, of course, as well. So at the beginning of my internship with them, um, they had achieved over 8 million hours lost time injury free, um, and they had a lost um, time injury frequency of zero. Um, so what this reflects pretty clearly is Torex's uh, commitment to prioritizing in health and safety for their workplace, for their workers. Um, so, and to continue to want to achieve this high standard, they wanted to find additional ways that they could help um, mitigate risk by reflecting on their past to really ensure that any lessons that were available to them were captured and could be applied to their future strategy planning. So this is where I came in. Um, Torex was interested in having a student conduct a multi-year analysis, really do a deep dive into the wealth of data that they have been collecting for many, many years. Um, and they had three data sets in mind. So their first was incident and inspection data. The second one was alcohol and drug. And then the third one was very um, pertinent to the current time. It was their COVID-19 testing and reporting system. Uh, now, of course, to respect um, the non-disclosure with Torex, I'm not able to share the specifics of those projects or their findings or the recommendations that I submitted to them. Uh, but in place of this, and what I thought would be most beneficial to um, the audience today, was to speak through the process that I followed, um, and then perhaps some of the opportunities that big data analysis uh, could benefit uh, health and safety departments and other industries. Uh, so I am speaking through this as a mining example, um, however, it's, it really is uh, applicable across the many, many sectors. And I'd also like to preface that any of the visuals or graphs that I use throughout the rest of the presentation are entirely fabricated. They do not represent Torex's uh, data. So a slight little bit of background on this term of big data that I've used a few times now. Um, it really is a basic term that just means that you have a large amount of data. Uh, it can be in any form and it can be in any type. It's just a giant database. Um, but in order to actually do something with that, to do that deep dive that Torex was asking for and extract knowledge from it, I had to come up with an analytic technique. And the one that I ended up settling on is called data mining. And funny enough, data mining follows a very similar process to the mining life cycle. So what I've done today is I've overlaid the two of them, so mineral mining and data mining, across those five kind of key phases. So we'll start with mineral mining and data mining in the phase of exploration. So we always start in this position that's geological mapping, that's establishing target areas. Um, but with data, the environment that we're exploring or the landscape is this raw data set. And one of the things that we can do is use a term called the 10 Vs. And this is what helps situate ourselves initially within this wealth of data. So kind of a little checklist, we start with looking at the volume. How much data do you actually have? If you've got too little, you might not be able to get the questions answered yet. If you've got too much, you might have to reassess the resources that you're putting towards it or your timeline. Then I looked, checked in on the venue of the data. So with Torx, making sure that um, I was going to be able to access the data that I needed, or if not, I was going to be able to set up the pathways appropriate with uh, Nelson and the partners um, to be able to get that resources into the right place. 
Also checking it on the variety. So often, especially with accident data, we're looking at numeric data. So how many accidents occurred, the date, the time, um, how many people were involved, but we're also looking at written words. So those descriptions of what take, took place as well and how much um, value they can add to the study. You also have to check in on the validity of your data. So this is the quality that's actually being captured. Um, so certain things like, uh, especially in accident data, we've got severity matrices, and these aren't always universal across all companies. So we have to make sure that the terms that are being used were being used correctly, and that I'm gonna be interpreting them uh, correctly as well. Veracity is our data accuracy. So fairly similar, um, but this one here I was looking at was anything missed? Is there any data that wasn't captured in this report? If something was input manually, was it done so with a high degree of accuracy? So if it was something that was written on site and then transcri or transcribed and then put into the computer base, was it done so well? Vocabulary is another big one, especially with in Canada where we've got a lot of bilingual companies. Torex uh, was actually Spanish and English and often those words are intermingling. Something as simple as yes and C in a data set aren't gonna pull together the way that I would want. So going back through and checking on those types of things um, is an initial first step that you can't miss. Velocity is you checking in on the speed of which your data is being generated. So we have to have a snapshot in time, something like COVID-19, that data is constantly coming in, um, but you can't be adding new data to the data set while you're doing this analysis. So knowing what snapshot in time is of interest to you and to your partner. Then vagueness, so meaning and descriptions coming into importance here, um, especially with written descriptions. So an example would be if something said a hand injury took place. It doesn't give us a lot of details. We don't know if that's a laceration or a crush injury. We don't know if it caused a first aid or a lost time. So making sure that if the data set that you have doesn't have that detail, maybe you can supplement it with some other resources as well. Then the variability, and this one's really relevant for health and safety data because legislation is always changing and data sets are evolving. Workplaces are going through different phases of their own mind cycles or leadership phases. Um, so knowing that the data as well might have different things captured at different points in time. So you need the context behind the data set as well. And the final one, and this is the most important one, is value. This is the usefulness of the data. So you've, you're checking in all of this, but if the data set you have isn't gonna answer the question that you're asking, it really doesn't have that much value to you. So it's not based on the size or the scope of it, it's based on whether it truly has value to the question that you're trying to answer. Okay, so then hopefully in that exploration and all that initial work, we have a discovery. So we have found something of value and we have found something that's gonna be useful to us. So this would be like doing some field work, some planning, um, and really kind of setting up the project. So for myself, the same thing, I was looking for those supplementary resources in this phase, learning definitions and matrices that, that were specific to Torx as a company, and really situating myself within this new set, new found data set. So moving into phase three, this is development. Um, so feasibility studies would be happening in mineral mining, moving to construction and development. And so I followed the same in that I had this strategy that I was coming up with and I needed to present it to my partner. So uh, Nelson and I had weekly meetings um, where I was able to pitch this to him, get it approved, finish up kind of cleaning that data. And then my construction and development was creating my code books, creating my templates that I would be putting into the different software programs I was using for the data analysis and really getting that nice and clean so that when the fun phase happened, which came next, um, I was very prepared. So this is production. In mineral mining, we're talking extraction, milling, processing raw materials. And really this is where you're getting to see beneath the surface, reward for your prep work is starting to happen. Um, so for me, what this looked like um, was kind of a multi-stage distilling process of the data. And I followed kind of five key analysis steps for it. So up first I did an individual analysis. So this was very, very uh, basic statistics, descriptives, looking at each variable on an individual level. So how many spills occurred, how many personal injuries, how many equipment damages, whatever the data set looks like for you, just getting a very, very specific level done on the individual variable basis. From there, I could build a little bit. So I started doing segmental analysis. So 
looking at kind of subgroups. So easy ones to think of would be types of employment. So do we have contractors or company employees? Which location or roadway are accidents happening on? And time of year is another great example. Here, maybe the winter with the icy roads is a concern. In Mexico, rainy season um, was one of the things to look out for. So very similar, but association analysis kind of starts to build the building blocks here. And almost like a game of Clue, I was creating more specific pictures within the data. So which individuals at which places and at which times were involved in which type of accident. So creating many stories so that I could better explore and understand what was happening. Two other really cool kind of associations that I did with their data set um, was I looked at their mining cycle. So I looked at when they were in phases of construction and development, um, maybe any down periods versus production. Did they have any changes to their accident frequencies? And then the really neat one was I also looked at different safety initiatives that they've implemented over time, different incident managements, different um, frameworks that they've used, and was able to see from the point of implementation till now, have we seen any positive influences from those? So another step is outlier identification. And this one really kind of happens throughout the first three because things popped out to me at different points in time. But a really clear example here is fatalities. Um, in most workplaces, and we really hope this is always the case, it's a low frequency event, um, of course, a very high severity. But because of this, there's not a lot of trend data to it, but it has a ton of value to us and warrants deeper, deeper investigation. So I would identify that any outliers that perhaps were in the data related to um, any kind of one-offs, and then I would explore those deeper aside from it being related to a trend. The other really cool thing was the ability to do uh, safety pyramids. So this is where you're looking at how many near misses are captured at the bottom, moving up to very high severity events at the top. And the idea being that you could do this for your company over a set period of time and hopefully see the widening of the base of the period. So a very visual um, way to interpret your data as well. So the last thing that I did in the analysis was a predictive analysis. So using some stat software, SPSS, I put their data back through it and was trying to make any predictions about whether or not um, from the history of the data, if we could forecast or foreshadow when something would take place to potentially intervene. But learned a really great lesson here, which I'll touch on in two slides. Um, the other similarity I wanted to mention in relation to production um, is that both in mineral mining and data mining, scope of study or scope or the life cycle of the mine is influenced by the quality and the quantity of the mineral deposit or of the data set. Um, so to give you a bit of context, the first project I did was a seven year data set and it took me 90 hours. The second one was 35 hours for a two year data set. And then COVID-19 of course is about a year of data and that took 25 hours just to give kind of a reference for, for scope. So the final phase of the mining life cycle is reclamation. This one's a slight bit more of a, of a stretch for the overlap, but I make it nonetheless. Um, this is where I provided them technical reports, all of the recommendations, um, protected the data sets back up, cleared that all up, and then official closure of the analyses. And so what resulted from these deep dives um, was I presented back to Nelson three technical reports that him and his um, health and safety and management teams could review and hopefully are able to use some of it for proactive prevention initiatives uh, for the future of the company. So to, to finish off, so just some learning outcomes that I wanted to share. Um, of course, as a student in this experience, any opportunity to strengthen analysis and um, statistical analysis skill sets is in, of huge value to us. So this was a great opportunity with very real, raw, live data that had meaning and value behind it. So that was um, a great learning opportunity. Then, like I spoke to you there about prediction. So learned a great um, concept that what's it may not be predictable, but it doesn't mean it's not preventable. All of my predictive analysis essentially failed in that they had terrible confidence intervals. Um, their accuracy was very, very weak. Um, but that doesn't mean that the accidents aren't still preventable by addressing these other smaller trends, some of the near misses, and really strong um, safety initiatives to help stop what we can't necessarily prevent or predict. The other thing I wanted to note is that I working with Torex was fantastic. It was a company that demonstrates top-down leadership that's got embedded safety in all levels. Um, and you can really see it not through just through the statistics, but from my experiences working with them, 
um, and diving deeper into some of their, their literature and their documentation, um, that was pretty influential to my learning as well. Then there's the geographic and the sociocultural distinctions. Having worked in some of the, with mining companies here locally, this is a very unique context. It's a very remote area of the world, um, different language, different culture that's influencing the workplace there, different legislation. So I was very happy to have that experience as well. And then another great learning just to close off, and I think it's really a big part of why my experience with Torx was so great, um, was having worked directly with Nelson. He had weekly touch points with me for an hour. He prioritized the work I was doing. He was so clear with his expectations. He valued the work um, and he was really appreciative and open with that appreciation. And I think that that was a huge part of why this project together was successful and i um, excited for future opportunities um, with them as well. So just like to end um, with another expression of gratitude to Krosh and Dr. Sandra Dorman for coordinating my internship uh, and to Torx and Nelson for the opportunity and mentorship. Um, but I'd be happy and open to any questions that people may have. Thanks, Emily. Um, yeah, personally, I just think it's so cool. Just now I've got this mental model of matching the data mining with the mineral mining. So that, that works really well for me. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a couple questions. So the first one is, are you uh, finished with your project, your PhD now, and, and how long did the project take in total? So my, my PhD project is uh, very separate from this. So I'm just still in my first year of my PhD. So four more years to go on that um, heat stress in underground mining related to um, the kidneys. But for this project here, it took about, I guess about four months, about averaged out to about 10 hours a week uh, to reach that 150 hours. So the big chunk of the work was that accident data, and then the other two were kind of smaller projects that I completed um, after the fact. But yes, now this project with Torex is is complete, and they've been uh, the reports have been submitted to them. Very cool. Um, and the next is um, a more like a, re a recommendation, and um, that you might get a, a better confidence inf intervals when doing it like a deeper dive to systemic risks. Um, I don't know if that if that makes sense to you, or if that's uh something that uh, that uh, one of our audience members uh, brought forward. Very cool. I will have to look up that a little bit more. So that was the great opportunity for me with this was um, predictive analysis was not something that I had been exposed to in any previous studies or projects I've been involved with. And this is where the learning for the students is, is so great because you're getting to do it um, live real time with, like I said, data that has meaning behind it. Um, so yeah, I'll be excited to, to look this up for to better future ones for sure. So thank you for Sujoy Day for uh, for bringing that uh, that up. Uh, we've got a, a couple more minutes, um, and so Sujoy, uh, his next the next their next follow up comment is it sets up a foundational constructs for predictive analysis. So, uh, um, and then we do have a um, question here, so uh, from Dr. Adesesh. Um, so heat stress and for, regarding heat stress and kidney, does this relate to non traditional nephropathy as seen in South America? Exactly. Yes. So I'm attempting to draw parallels between um, the underground environment we have in Canada here, especially with many of our mines um, deepening. Um, the underground environment is now very much mimicking the above ground temperatures in Mesoamerican countries um, that their agricultural workers are experiencing. So yes, so it's called um, chronic kidney disease of an unknown etology, and they link it back to dehydration, excessive physical exertion, um, and uh, and the environmental temperature kind of factoring in. So yeah, that's gonna be more to come soon on that maybe in the next crash presentation. 